In this screencast, we're just going to go over a couple of images in uh, Chinese sculpture, which is part of our bigger, you know, Chinese art, and then also part of our Asian art content area. There's some um, overall information about Chinese sculptures. Really, there's quite a variety of Chinese sculpture. Um, they are definitely known for a lot of their large scale colossal sculptures. So remember, we have um, the Longmen Caves and kind of a lot of large colossal Buddha sculptures. Um, but Chinese sculpture is also known for their colossal size and enormous size sculpture um, still being extremely intricate and paying attention to detail. Um, they were able to create large scale sculpture without um, sacrificing any artistic integrity at all. Um, you have um, sculptures that are naturalistic, being cut from uh, cliffs and rocks, um, but you also are working with a country that is very vast in their natural resources. So a lot of their materials and mediums are going to be very specific to their region. Some of those things are like um, jade, for example. So China is, you know, bountiful for jade, um, which is, you know, very unique to that region. Um, and because of that, jade is considered an extremely um, precious material to China. It's full of a lot of kind of mystical um, beliefs that, you know, it holds um, certain powers and, and certain kind of um, preciousness. Um, and so you'll see a lot of sculptures also out of jade, which is a very, very dense kind of precious material. Um, China also has different types of jade. That's important. We're very familiar with the green tones of jade, but it's also important to understand that jade also comes in more off-white bone type of colors as well. Um, since jade is a, is a precious stone, um, a lot of these sculptures are miniature sculptures. And they're known for their, um, not just their small size, but then their extreme um, intricate and ornate characteristics, which again is, you know, very difficult when dealing with such a very hard, dense material. Um, being able to carve something on a small scale with extreme detail, um, that is, you know, very difficult to um, manipulate and carve. Um, really sh kind of is a testimony to um, Chinese determination and skill and mastery of sculpture. We do have two images um, for our sculpture unit, and the first one is kind of on that, you know, very colossal sculpture um, uh, arena, and this is image 193. Uh, it's titled The Terracotta Warriors from the Qin Dynasty, and we're looking at BC era um, construction, and specifically the warriors are um, constructed out of terracotta, which is a, uh, you know, mined clay, a locally mined clay from the earth that is um, very kind of um, brownish, red-brown in color. And so there is a lot of contextual information that goes along with the Terracotta Warriors um, and the Shin Dynasty, which is why there is a documentary that goes with this image. Um, that's where you're going to get a lot of your contextual information, which is extremely important to understand if you're going to appreciate um, the, the image that AP has given us for these terracotta warriors. Um, when we look at these images, we can be extremely impressed by what we see, but then when we understand that that is literally a fraction, the smallest amount um, of, of understanding the bigger picture to um, this necropolis of the first emperor of China, then um, it's, it's just vital to understand that big picture. 
um, and not just the terracotta warriors themselves. So the terracotta warriors is is almost like you know just a sample of of what AP wants you to understand about this entire um, tomb slash mausoleum. And so that's what the documentary is going to do for you. Um, but specifically, I'm taking a moment just to speak on. Um, some of the, the basics of this mausoleum and the terracotta warriors themselves. Um, just to give you some numbers to understand the significance of this. Um, what we have here in terms of the warriors themselves is we have over 8,000, correct, 8,000 terracotta warriors that were discovered in this tomb. There's um, over 100 wooden chariots and then there are two bronze chariots that represent um, the chariots for the emperor himself the warriors were also armed with weapons so there's over thirty thousand weapons also um that were created for this tomb and when i say weapons i do not mean replicated weapons i mean um weapons of of you know, original materials of metals that were made with the same integrity of the weapons that were actually used for warfare. Um, all of this, again, is part of the tomb uh, of the emperor, which is um, Chen Shi, Shi Huangdi, um, who has kind of renamed himself many times. So it's like we see, we do see his name in many different ways, which can get confusing. So often I just refer to him as the first emperor, uh, as many people do. Um, so this is all part of his burial tomb in preparation for his afterlife. Um, the terracotta warriors themselves are actually um, slightly larger than life size. They are um, a minimum of six feet, like between six feet and six six. And um, when I say larger than life size, you know, we have to remember we're in a civilization of the Chinese, which are usually um, uh, a group of people that are a little bit smaller in scale. So for them, a six foot six three sculpture was definitely larger than life. Um, the military. Um, showed you know absolute precision in every single way these warriors were also um, replicated by some hierarchy of scale um, according to military rank and what is extremely amazing about these warriors which you definitely need to know is they were not constructed from molds um, a mold would quickly produce um, you know, would, would quickly allow for mass production. But the problem with a mold is that you are mass producing kind of the same, um, the same design over and over and over again. And that was not um, okay with the um, first emperor. So it was important that each and every terracotta warrior of, of the 8,000, each and every one was handmade um, with coils because they needed to all be one of a kind and extremely distinct and different from each other. And there are theories that they, that these terracotta warriors were actually modeled off of the actual army itself um, because each and every single one of them have completely different expressions. They have completely different facial um, expressions, completely different facial recognition. They also have um, completely different attire and in terms of their, um, their armor and their, their badges, their medals, their accolades, um, hairstyles, even sh the shapes of their ears are all distinctive from one another. So it, they're, they're completely one of a kind and constructed um, by hand and not from mold. So that, that's important information. Um, this entire tomb was discovered recently in 1974 by farmers that were uh, digging in a water well. Um, and the uh, kind of um, the, st the archaeological studies of this necropolis, of this emperor's tomb, is actually still ongoing. Um, not very much of it has been excavated because 
um, anthropologists and archaeologists are still trying to figure out the best ways of doing it. They don't want to disturb the remains. They're not sure also, um, you know, what types of conditions things will be in, uh, in terms of the structure, like if it would be able to withhold an excavation. But then there's also kind of that spiritual and moral concern of not really having a desire to disturb the emperor himself. Um, so studies are still going, they're still learning about this, and really the only part of the tomb that has been excavated are these terracotta warriors. Warriors. So that's why we hear about them and we see them often, but also understanding this is just an absolute mere fraction of the entire tomb. Um, the emperor himself began construction of his tomb at a very young age. He became uh, emperor at a very young age, um, but when he took on full power um, and united China is really when he um, began construction of his tomb. I think it's also important to understand that all of the uh, warriors, but then also the other figures, the terracotta figures that were found within the tomb, were at one time extremely brightly painted. So um, the because of exposure to oxygen, the paints had definitely flaked off, and that's why we're left with just kind of the bare clay. But in its um, original construction, they were highly painted. So I have some examples up here to show you some reconstruction of the terracotta warriors and figures that were also found in the tomb um, in their, you know, uh, perfectly finished and highly painted um, status. That is another important thing is, you know, we do have terracotta warriors, but also understanding that there were other um, figures and sculptures that were part of the tomb as well. Um, things like royal attendants and entertainers, acrobats, um, and, you know, other important um, uh, members of his like royal court were also constructed and placed within the tomb as well. There's also evidence that around his actual um, tomb, it was surrounded by flowing rivers of mer mercury. And mercury actually plays a very, very important and significant role um, to this tomb and to the story of the first emperor. Um, so the documentary that is part of this lesson will really get into the importance of mercury. Um, and interestingly enough, we talked about those, those weapons that were um, constructed and placed in the tomb as well. Shortly after the tomb was complete, um, the tomb was raided and looted, and um, all of those real weapons were actually stolen. Um, and used in uh, in a revolution. So we don't have a lot of the um, uh, the actual relics um, of the weapons themselves. We have some some parts, some evidence of um, the weapons. Um, we but we also have have evidence that the warriors themselves, when they were created, they were created with their hands in um, a position to actually hold a weapon. Um, and so that, along with some, re, uh, you know, relics and remains of weapons within the tomb, uh, helped to understand that all of the warriors were armed with some, some sort of weapon, but that the weapons themselves were stolen at one point. And then over time, um, at, at a certain point, then this entire um, Acropolis, the entire tomb was then buried under earth. And again, the documentary will really get into some of that information. Um, the other thing that the documentary will talk about is the emperor himself. He is a very interesting, um, a amazing man who accomplished so much, but then also really um, battled some uh, interesting philosophies and theories and um, personal endeavors. And one of them was his obsession with immortality. 
um, and he, much of during much of his reign, he sought out the secret to immortality. Um, and alongside, you know, his kind of barbaric ways of ruling and um, kind of his eternal search for immortality um, makes for a very, very interesting um, historical figure and a big part of why a documentary is part of this lesson. So there is a link right here, um, the first emperor documentary, so you can reach the documentary from this link, um, but I will also be posting it separately in Classroom. So our next um, image for Chinese sculpture is something extremely different. Um, so it's image 204. It's called the David Vases. It is a set of two. It is from the 14th century. Um, and what we're looking at here is white porcelain with cobalt blue underglaze. Those, that is the mediums. And the reason why we're looking at these is because um, it is important to pause and make sure that we um, take a moment to appreciate porcelain. So porcelain is also a type of clay. It is a white clay that can be fired at very, very high temperatures. Um, and because of that, it is extremely um, strong and non-porous, um, but then it also fires to this beautiful, brilliant white, um, where you know, most clays in their you know, kind of naturalistic state um, could be terracotta, which gives you this kind of brown earthy color, or stoneware, which gives you more of like kind of a dirty gray color. Um, so porcelain is this beautiful, pure white color that is extremely dense and strong and high fired, which is a, a really beautiful quality. Um, a lot of the properties of porcelain, which is um, kaolin, is mined and uh, you know, found in abundance um, in Asia. So it, it is important that we, you know, definitely take a look at porcelain because of its connection to um, Asian cultures, but also, you know, geographically. Um, so this is a blue and white porcelain, and the function of it is it's, it's an altar piece. It was um, made for the altar of a Taoist temple um, there is a third piece that actually went along with it, which we do not have, but the third piece is an incense burner. Um, and this is kind of a typical altar set. Um, what's important to also understand about this piece is that this is wheel thrown, so it kind of has that, that um, shows that innovation of, you know, kind of technical development that a lot of our pottery that we've looked at thus far has been, you know, hand built with coils or, or some sort of um, sculpting method, but we are actually looking at, you know, a, a wheel thrown vase form. So utilizing the spinning um, of, a, of a wheel to create this piece of pottery. Um, the other thing that's important to understand is this, this blue and white style of porcelain pottery, which is very um, significant and can be attributed to a lot of um, Chinese style um, porcelain artwork. So the blue color itself um, is imported from Iran um, and the Chinese really embraced this blue color um, and kind of um, you know, turned it into one of their uh, cultural styles. And then the Chinese were the ones that then took this and really expanded it um, into, you know, um, kind of Western and with, you know, importing and exporting um, and with, it kind of got its significance and, and its attribution more with Chinese style than it did um, Iranian. Um, this style is um, kind of um, distinctive to the um, Yuan Dynasty. Uh, so this this particular you know time in Chinese history is really when this blue and white porcelain um, was kind of um, innovated and invented. Uh, the vases themselves, the shape of them, 
were modeled after typical bronze vases, but then, um, so keeping that style and keeping that form, but now using just the porcelain medium. Um, so in terms of the imagery that we have on these vases, so the neck and the foot of the vase, so the, the top and the bottom portion, so the neck and the foot, um, what we see here are leaves and flower shapes, um, you know, repeated patterns of leaves and flowers. The handles themselves, which, you know, if you don't look closely, you may not notice, but they are in the shape of an elephant head. And then the central section, which is called the body of the vase, what we have here are those Chinese dragons with the, you know, very long traditional bodies and um, beards on the dragons. Um, the dragons are, you know, decorative with um, scales and claws, and they are kind of maneuvering around um, the sky in a sea of clouds. So in terms of um, content and, you know, what we're looking at on the decorative um, part of that, those are the images that we're looking at. The vases themselves, they're called the David vases because they are named after Sir Percival David, who was a collector of Chinese art. So he is um, you know, kind of the, the owner of these vases as a collector, and that's actually what they're titled after because there probably was not an original title since they were just um, created as functional altarpieces. Um, we talked about porcelain clay being um, a fine particle clay and, and very durable. You have that silky white color with the blue underglaze on top, which is painted on. Um, and again, that this is um, porcelain is very, you know, geologically rich in this region. And that finishes up our Chinese sculpture um, screencast. And now I'm going to let you um, indulge in the documentary of the first emperor. And I really hope that you enjoy that information.